Hey grade 11s, um, here is your act four video for Macbeth. Um, I want to start by talking about act four, scene one. This is one of my favorite scenes in Macbeth. Um, the witches chant and dance around a bubbling cauldron brewing a spell. Macbeth enters their cave, demanding that they answer his questions. In fact, he would prefer that the universe be turned into chaos rather than be denied what he wants to know. This time, the prophecies are spoken by apparitions. A head wearing a battle helmet, a crown covered, sorry, a blood covered child, and a child wearing a crown carrying a tree. They tell Macbeth to beware of Macduff, that he will not be killed by anyone born of woman, and that he will be defeated only when the trees of Burnham Wood move towards the castle. So there are three prophecies, and um, each image has a prophecy connected to it, okay? As with the earlier prophecies, his knowledge of the first is correct convinces Macbeth that the next two are also valid. His new sense of security is weakened, however, when his insistent demand about Banquo's descendants is answered by a parade of apparition kings, each resembling Banquo. As Macbeth curses the witches in rage, they dance and disappear. Lennox enters the cave to tell Macbeth that messengers have brought news that Macduff has fled to the English court. Furious, Macbeth swears to kill Macduff's family. So of course, just reminding you guys that act four in um, Shakespearean plot is um, heading towards catastrophe, okay? So bearing in mind that things are going to start unraveling really, really quickly right now. So, ha, the witches brew. Um, when we go back and we talk about the Elizabethan belief in witches and some of the, the medical beliefs and things like that, I think that that will, if you think about that as I'm reading to you, what's in this witch's brew will kind of hopefully make you smile today, okay? So the witches are all together. Thrice the brinded cat hath mewed, thrice and once the hedge pig whined. Harpier cries, tis time, tis time, round about the cauldron we go. In the poison entrails throw, toad that under cold stone days and nights has thirty-one sweltered venom sleeping got. Boil thou first in the charmed pot. So, um... <laughs> I have a charmed pot for us. It's actually my canning pot, but it looks like a witch's cauldron. <laughs> so, and I have some things we're going to, to boil up in here. So double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bowl. So they put in a fenny snake. Um, I am newt toe a frog. Um, but I have this little devil, and I also have this freaky thing. Um, wool of bat and tongue of dog. Ugh. Oh, jeez. Got a little crazy there. Adder's fork and blind worm sting, lizard leg and owlet's wing. For a charm of powerful trouble, like a hell broth, boil and bubble. Okay. Scale of dragon, tooth of wolf, which is mummy, maw and gulf of the raven, salt sea shark, root of hemlock. Dig it in the dark. Um, this is my favorite part. Liver of a blaspheming Jew. So if you look in your notes, you guys can see the liver was believed to be the center of passions. Jews would be seen as blasphemous because they did not believe in the divinity of Christ. So, essential that you have a liver of a blaspheming Jew, okay? Gall of goat and slips of you, slivered in the moon's eclipse, nose of Turk and Tartar's lips, finger of a birth, strangled babe delivered by a drab. Again, guys, look at your notes. This is shasty mcnasty okay um so 
a birth strangled babe is like a child who's died in, in childbirth, ditch delivered, so like literally popped out in a ditch by a prostitute. Essential, essential parts in here, so sorry. Um, make the gruel thick and slab, and there too, a tiger's children for the ingredients of a cauldron. Double, double, doiler, double, fire burn, a cauldron bubble. Cool it with some baboon's blood. <laughs> oh God. Then the charm is firm and good. Okay. Oh, I have this unicorn horn. That better, that better go in there, I think. Um, and then they say the famous words, by the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. Enter Macbeth. And he says, this is, not, this is an awesome line. How now, you secret black and midnight hags? Okay. Um, and then they have their, tell me, Macbeth, tell me what's going to happen with my life from now on. And the first which says, speak, demand, will answer, say if thou'd rather hear it from our mouths or from our master. Okay. Um, so here are the things that um, Macbeth is told through these witches. Um, first, beware Macduff, which he knows, right? Macduff, he finds out, has fled to England to find an army to overthrow Macbeth, that stuff. But then he sees this bloody child and he finds out, none born of woman shall harm Macbeth. Ooh, there's like a little rainbow on my paper. It's nice. That's love. Um, so, not born of woman. That's pretty lofty. Like, everybody's born of woman, I think. Okay. Um, there's also the child wearing a crown holding a tree. Macbeth shall never be vanquished, shall never be beaten until Burnham Wood moves to Dunsany. Well, how can an entire wooded area move? to a castle. It's like saying um, when Big Knife Park moves to Forestburg. Okay, so just think about that in a way. And then he sees eight Banquo ghost kings, um, which represent uh, the, the heirs, right? So um, the descendants of Banquo and Banquo being the father of kings. Okay, so um, at the end of this scene, uh, Macbeth finds out that, in fact, Macduff has gone to England. He should be where. Um, this hasn't really helped Macbeth feel better about things, actually, which often, you know, predictions or the truth, it's not always beautiful. So in the end, he says in an aside, which is, of course, um, turning to the stage and saying, Time, thou anticipatest my dread exploits. The flighty purpose never is overtook unless the deed go with it. From this moment, the very firstlings of my heart shall be the firstlings of my hand. And even now, to crown my thoughts with acts, be it thought and done, the castle of Macduff I will surprise, seize upon Fife, give to the edge of the sword his wife, his babes, his babes, and all unfortunate souls that trace him in a line. No boasting like a fool, this deed I'll do before this purpose cool, but no more sights. Where are these gentlemen? Come, bring me to where they are. So in the end, he resolves um, Macduff. The witches told me to watch out for you. I knew I had to watch out for you. I'm going to go to Fife, and I'm going to kill your wife and your family. That's what he decides to do. Okay, um, so. I'm just going to flip through here. Um, act 4, scene 2. Ross visits his relative Lady Macduff at her castle in Fife. Remember that Lady Macduff, she is not happy. She is, like, uh, Macduff left her there with her kids, unprotected, unguarded, um, for the betterment of Scotland. But she's alone, okay? So Ross comes to visit her, and he hopes to assure her that Macduff's flight to England was for valid reasons. She does not accept Ross's argument, for she and her children are now very vulnerable, okay? 
After Russ leaves, Lady Macduff and her son discuss treason and related matters, and she is amused by his intelligent and perceptive comments. An unidentified messenger arrives to warn Lady Macduff of danger, but he comes too late. The murderers burst in, stab the child, and pursue the screaming Lady Macduff. So imagine being Lady Macduff. Her husband has outright opposed the king, Macbeth, and has now fled to England to rally an army with Malcolm. Um, so he has angered a mentally unstable tyrant, and then he leaves his whole family unprotected. Okay, Lady Macduff is not happy, she's very vulnerable, um, and then uh, she's killed at the end of the scene. All of Macduff's children and his wife are murdered by the vicious tyrant Macbeth's actions, okay? So this is um, the part that people, people do really like to laugh about because um, they, he, so the little boy, the side Macduff's son, they try to, he tries to fight back. And in Elizabethan language, I love, so the murderer says, he's a traitor. And the son says, thou liest, thou shaggy-eared villain. And then the murderer says, what, you egg? And then kills Macduff's son. What, you egg? And then he says, young fry of treachery. And the son says, he has killed me, mother. He has killed me, mother. Okay. Um, so all of that is just like very dramatic, very Elizabethan. And uh, I love that they say, I love that they refer to him as um, an egg and a young fry of treachery. Um, Act four, scene three, because we're just going to rip through this if you guys have listened. And um, hopefully today you're taking the time to watch. So this is a very confusing scene, I feel. So I'm going to explain it. I'll read the synopsis to you, and then I'm going to explain it, and I'm going to point out a couple of things for you guys. So in this scene, um, Macduff has arrived in England. Okay, so this is between Macduff and Malcolm, Duncan's son, who is the successor. Okay. Macduff has arrived at the court of Edward the Confessor, King of England. He meets Malcolm and attempts to convince him that they should prepare to invade Scotland. However, Malcolm points out that he would be foolish to accept unquestioningly Macduff's appearance of loyalty. So Malcolm's like, I'm not sure that I can really trust you, Macduff. What's in this for you, okay? Um, then Malcolm, he pulls a little prank ski. And he describes in vivid detail the kind of king he would be. Corrupt, greedy, lecherous. Lecherous is a word to describe um, lusty dudes, okay? Um, and vicious. The horrified Macduff prepares to leave, convinced that neither Scotland nor he himself can be saved. Malcolm's test has succeeded. So Malcolm just says like, mm, you know what? Um, Macduff, I don't think I'd be a very good king for A, B, C, and D reasons, so you should go find somebody else. And it's all just like a test, which is weird. Um, so then, now able to, ex so Malcolm's test has succeeded, and Macduff prepares to leave, convinced that neither Scotland nor he himself can be saved. So as soon as Macduff hears Malcolm say all these nasty things about himself, um, he's like, nope, this isn't going to work, I'm going to go home. And Malcolm's like, mm, just kidding, it was all a lie. Now able to accept Macduff's integrity, he withdraws all the accusations he has made against himself and describes the way he really is. So Malcolm, truly, in his heart, he is virtuous, honest, loyal, ready to serve his country. And he further informs Macduff that an English force of 10,000 soldiers is ready to invade Scotland. So like, he's on it. He's going to fight for his precious Scotland, okay? Malcolm praises King Edward's piety and royal virtues and describes his special ability to prophecy and to heal those affected from scrofula, which is a form of tuberculosis. Um, Ross arrives from Scotland, unfortunately, at the end of this scene, 
and um, speaks of the worsening horrors of Macbeth's tyranny. So at the end of this scene, Macduff has really proved himself to be a good friend of Scotland, okay? Um, he wants what's best for Scotland. Unfortunately, though, Ross tells Macduff that his entire family has been killed by murderers, okay? Excuse me. Oh, getting, getting a little emotional there. Um, so Ross finally breaks, Ross Vincent finally breaks the news of their murder. Macduff's overwhelming sorrow gradually gives way to a determination to, def to confront and kill Macbeth. So um, in my notes I put, Macduff does not know what has happened to his family yet at the start of this scene. Uh, Malcolm will not be fooled after seeing Macbeth in action. He will not be a pawn to another ambitious tyrant. So like any logical person, would do, ha ha. He tests Macduff by lying and saying how awful a king he would be. It works. Macduff decides to leave and Malcolm comes clean, ha ha, cooked you. Um, he's actually pretty lame and might make a good king. And then 10,000 soldiers prepare to take Scotland back from Macbeth, hooray. And then Ross ruins it all by telling Macduff that his whole family is dead. Okay. Um, so some stuff from Act 4, Scene 3 though. Uh, and I just put a little, it, I put a little asterisk next to because I thought you guys would get a kick out of this. At the top of page 195, like line 70, when Malcolm is talking about why he would be, would not be a good king at first, he says, Am I voluptuousness? Your wives, your daughters, your matrons, and your maids cannot fill up the cistern of my lust. So he is like, there aren't even enough ladies for me in this world. Like, your sisters aren't safe, your mothers aren't safe, your wives aren't safe, your grandmas aren't safe. Okay, so that's what Malcolm is saying. And then when he's like, I actually tricked you, he says, I'm yet unknown to women. Right? So he's like, no, dude, I'm, I'm just like an average prince, virgin hanging out here, um, you know, ready to lead Scotland, and be a good man, okay? Um, after Ross tells Macduff about um, the death of his family, it's very sad, okay? Um, he, he's obviously quite upset and, um, he says, um, Merciful, so he says, my, he asks, my, how is my wife, my children too, wife, children, servants, all that could be found. And I must from me hence, my wife killed too, I have said. And then he is so upset and he says, he has no children. And he's talking about my path, okay? So he, he, it's like impossible for him to think, oh my God. All my children are dead. All my pretty ones, did you say all? Oh, hell kite, all. What? All my pretty chickens and they're down at one fell swoop. And Malcolm's like, dispute it like a man. Go get him. Go get that Macbeth and show him. And Macduff says, I shall do so. But I must also feel it as a man. I cannot but remember such things were that were most precious to me. Did heaven look on and would not take their part? Sinful Macduff, they were all struck for me. So my whole family was killed about, you know, because it's my fault. Not that I am, not for their own demerits, but for mine, fell slaughter on their souls, heaven rest them now. And then Malcolm says, be this the whetstone of your sword, let grief convert to anger, blunt not the heart, enrage it, okay? So um, we, we are coming into act five with Macduff enraged. He has an army of 10,000 English soldiers behind him. He has King Edward, um, his blessing behind him. He has Malcolm behind him. And all Macbeth has are um, these prophecies falsely kind of boosting up his ego. And um, it's it, you're going to see this catastrophe like 
coming to a head in Act 5. So Macduff is coming for you, Macbeth, and there's nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, just like this long. Okay? Um, so tomorrow, I'll have you guys listen to Act 5. We are on the home stretch. This is fantastic. Um, I'll do a similar lesson for you guys on Friday, about Act 5. We will be done. Um, next week, we're going to watch the Ides of March. And your large assessment for this unit, I've kind of um, shuffled some things around. And it's going to be a character analysis, a comparison of Macbeth to the film The Ides of March. So um, applying like information from Macbeth to that film, um, which will all become clear shortly. So don't panic, don't worry. Um, we're just taking it day by day. Okay guys, uh, take care of yourselves and we shall chat soon.